Good morning. Welcome to Hope Church. I'm so glad to see all of you here this morning. Would you stand? I don't know about you, but on a crisp, cool, sunny fall morning, I'm ready to praise the Lord. How about you? I hope that's why you're here. And I want everybody to help me out with a scripture reading this morning from Psalm 150. And your part is to say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's practice that. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. All right, as we read through this psalm, that's your part. Every time you see it in the bold print, and I'll read the rest. And let's begin our praise and worship this morning. Beginning with you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, harp, and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe and with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
that the enemy can have no hold on us here because we are a people of praise and praise is the breakthrough that we need this morning. And this morning, as we're praising you, hand in hand with praise comes our thanks and our gratitude, our thanks for who you are, our thanks for what you've done, how you've blessed us. And we just want to offer our gratitude to you this morning.
marvelous is your love for me. You know each of our names. You know each of our hearts. Lord Jesus, we just come to you this morning with all the praise and worship in our souls and our hearts and our minds, and we pour it out to you and we lift it up to you, Lord. Jesus, you are enough. No matter what's happening in our lives, no matter how the enemy may be attacking, you are enough. We seek you, we search for you, we want to lean into you and do life with you. And we are so grateful, we are so grateful that you want to do life with us as well. We praise you this morning and we give you all of our praise with all of our breath and our lungs. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may have a seat. And I must say, you all sound really good today. There was a time when I was just standing there, not even singing, but I'm glad you were. <laughs> and you sounded beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I could only imagine in my mind what the throne room of heaven was feeling with all your worship. It's magnificent. Well, as we transition into a few announcements of some things that are going on here, I'm sure you are all noticing the candy tower out in the lobby. It is up to the first level, and I think we have at least three more levels to go. And for as luck would have it, we have at least three more Sundays to go. <laughs> Okay, so if we can fill that candy tower up every level, every Sunday, I think we'll make it for our trunk or treat on the 31st of October, actually on Halloween. There are a lot of trunk or treats that happen at different various times throughout the month of October, but this one, ours, always happens on the actual Halloween, October 31st. So we're really looking forward to that. And in your bulletin, you will see an insert for how you can help with that. We don't need just candy, although that is a very, very important aspect. We also need trunks. We need people to sign up to come and put their trunk in the parking lot and decorate it up a little bit and pass out all this candy that we're collecting. So if you can come and help us with that, please sign up on that sheet and put it in the offering box on your way out. I want to encourage you to come and do that because there's something about October 31st that you might not realize, and that it's very much like Thanksgiving. The calories don't count. <laughs> okay, so it's literally a night of eating corn dogs, churros, cotton candy, candy that you're passing out, candy that you're passing out. <laughs> The candy that you're passing out and the candy that you're passing out, okay? <laughs> Bring an extra bag so that you can have some for yourself, right? But we need your help, and so I just encourage you to please sign up for that. It is a wonderful night. It's just fun of just all kinds of enthusiasm and children, and you're just not going to want to miss it. So I'd encourage you for that. Also, next Sunday, um, we are having a Discover Your Church and that will be happening right after this service, and we'll be having lunch. And we would encourage you to come and join us. If you're new or somewhat newish to Hope Church, we'd ask that you come join us, hear what we're doing here at Hope Church, a little bit of our visions, a little bit of, of things that we have planned for the upcoming year. So we'd ask that you would fill out that insert as well, put that in the offering box as you go out so that we know how to um, prepare for the food that we'll be having next Sunday for that event, and we just want to have you come and hang out with Drew and I and, and get to know us all a little bit better. So we welcome you to come and do that. At this time, don't forget, you know what to do with those yellow connection cards and that QR code, so go ahead and take time to do that as well. Thank you very much, Sherry. Well, hey, everybody, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Drew Foster. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here. Thanks for taking time to join us uh, today. It is going to be an amazing teaching. Trust me, I wrote it. And I stole it all from God. That's why it's good, not because I, I'm writing it. Uh, before we do that, 
I've got one more important thing that I want to talk to you about. Actually, ladies, I want to talk to you about something. We've got, we got, we got uh, some big news coming up in the month of November, and I want, to let, I want to let you know all about it. First off, watch this video for yourself. are filled with moments, moments stacked upon moment, building to the sum of our lives. When we were little, we pictured the moment of being this age. We may even have dreamt of the moments that led up to it. That first date, the graduation cap, the happy ending. Am I where I thought I'd be in this moment right now? didn't anticipate the worry. You know, the hours lying in bed trying to fall asleep, the ongoing inner replay of arguments already fought, the unfinished lists in your head. I bet you didn't anticipate the shame. Were we dreaming of the moments we'd hurt people, people we love with our mistakes? Were we dreaming of the shame of the things we'd say, the confidences broken, the compromises we'd make at work? at home? Were we thinking that at this moment we'd be a better mother by now, or a better wife, or even just a better woman? Our lives are filled with moments. Did we see these moments coming? Shame? Hurt? Disgrace? Pain? Guilt? Distress? Am I good with who I am? Are you proud of who you are? a moment, just one moment. What if these worries can be calmed? What if your fear, shame, guilt, disgrace, and pain could be redeemed? What if there was someone who sets your life in motion, who makes no mistakes? What if that one loves you and wants to free you today, this weekend? What if you can be at peace what if God himself paid the price to bring you to that peace, to take away your fear and your shame? It just takes a moment. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Because those who look to him are radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. Okay, so here at Hope Church, our mission is to bring hope into our community, helping people to love, live, and lead like Jesus. But there's a problem. Of, of the 11 to 12,000 people that call Coldwater proper its home, maybe, maybe 1,500 of them. Even, even all the churches that we have in this town Maybe 1,500 people, and that's, that, that's a high estimate. Maybe 1,500 people are actually connected to communities of faith, which means there's a lot of people that aren't. Now, there used to be a lot of people, they went to church with mom, they went to church with grandma, and they've just kind of fallen away. So they've tried church, they've tried Jesus, and they're kind of done with it right now. And then there's a bunch of people that are growing up, and they have no religious heritage whatsoever. So not only are there people who are done with church and faith and God, but there's people that are none. They, they, ha they have no religious background or foundation. And this rising section of, of all communities, friends, 
they're, they are less likely to walk into the doors of a local church on Sunday morning to a normal church service so then they can hear about the hope of Jesus, right? But a lot of these nuns and a lot of these duns, they are likely to come to a non-Sunday morning event that a church is hosting, right? And so I'm gonna say something now that all the ladies completely understand, especially in the church world. For decades and decades and decades, the church world has been male-dominated. Most pastorates, most pastors' offices are filled by men. And for decades and decades and decades, we pastors have been trained to not be alone with a female who's not your mom, your daughter, or your spouse. And that's some pretty good advice, except for the negative outcome of that is we have a lot of females that aren't being empowered and aren't being equipped like the men can be by the leadership of their church. And so we, we want to flip the script, right? We want Hope Church to be open for anybody and everybody. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? And there are just people that aren't going to come to church on a Sunday morning. But if there was like a mini conference style event, a one day where they could get invited, get a free meal, get entertained a little bit, hear a speaker who's going to talk about the hope of Jesus, they would be more likely to attend something like that. So I, I want to introduce you to you, our Women of Hope team. We've got Deb, Christina, Christina, and Sue. We couldn't find a third Christina, so Sue stepped up, and she's filling in. So this is our, our Women of Hope team, and we're going to be hosting on November 3rd at 5 p.m. Hope Church's very first E3 event. E3 stands for Encourage, Empower, Equip. We want to encourage every woman. We want to equip every woman. We want to empower every woman to be the person that God designed them to be. And so we're going to start putting together every two to three months E3 events where you, the regular everyday old person, can invite your coworker, your neighbor, your family member, your friend, people who are disconnected from a life of faith, you can invite them to this free event and they can come and hear about Jesus. They can come to our church, get a little bit of our culture. They can get a free meal and, and they can just hang out with other ladies who want to be encouraged and equipped. So these ladies are going to be walking around afterwards and, and, you know, from now until November, and they're going to have these little invite cards and they're going to personally invite you. But the expectation is that you take this card and you pray over it and say, Jesus, who do you want me to invite to this E3 event? This is, the, this is the next step in what we're doing here at Hope Church. And these ladies are going to do an amazing job of bringing hope into our community. Amen? Amen. All right. You are officially invited. All right. Well, first service clap for them, even though they didn't do anything. Right? <laughs> Way not to fail. Okay. So friends, this morning, we are continuing in our teaching series. Um, give me a second here. We're continuing in our teaching series, investigating our faith, where we've been asking some probing questions to try to figure out if what we actually believe is lining up with how we're actually living, right? I mean, if... We got, it, we got an escapee. That's awesome. <laughs> I thought the candy was up here. That's, that, that's sweet, right? Um, oftentimes, we as individuals, we say, oh, I believe in Jesus, or oh, I believe in this, and I believe in that. But then the way we live our lives doesn't really line up with that, right? Now, I'm, I'm not so much a gambling man. Like, I, I don't, like, actively gamble, um, except when I go to the Chinese buffet. <laughs> gamble with your health every time, right? But if I honestly believed 
if I really believed that my Indianapolis Colts were going to win the Super Bowl, like if I believed that, I would, I would wager every paycheck from now and, and, until the Super Bowl. If I really believed that, I'd do that if I believed in gambling. But I don't believe because my actions don't support it. And I think sometimes as Christians, we think that believing is just like, it, it's mental assent. I, this is what I believe from the head up, though it doesn't really play out in my life. And so today we're going to talk about probably the most important topic of the teaching series. What is our response to the word of God? What is our response to God's clear voice in scripture? Now, friends, I want to tell you something that I believe deeply in my bones. I believe that God wants to do amazing things in you. I believe strongly that God wants to do amazing things with you. And yes, God wants to do amazing, incredible things through you. Amen. Little old you, right? This is what God wants for you. I totally believe that. But I also believe that many of the things that God wants to do in us and many of the things that God wants to do with us and through us, they're never going to happen for one simple reason. Our level of partnership with God is too low. When you and I increase our level of partnership, and what I mean by that is our cooperation with him. And what I mean by that is simple obedience to the word and the voice of God. That, that's what cooperation and partnership with God truly look like. Amen. It's not following a, a list of to do's and to don'ts, right? It's okay, God, what's next? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be? How do you want me to do and be? It's, it's little steps of faith and obedience that increase our cooperation and increase our partnership. So for those of you who've had kids at any given time in your life, have you ever noticed that sometimes they're uncooperative? Right? Those little suckers, sometimes they just don't do what they're supposed to be doing. Right? And so they're not very good family partners. They're off doing their own thing, right? You know that moment, mom, dad, where finally you're sitting down and you're like, wow, finally some peace and quiet. And then you panic. Why is it so quiet in here? <laughs> and you look down and you see a Sharpie cap pin on the Sharpie cap on the floor. Oh, no. You notice the scissors are gone, right? Junior, juniorette, they're off doing their own thing. Have you ever noticed sometimes how kids just seem to do their own thing, right? They're not very good partners yet. They're not very cooperative yet. And we have to be trained to be cooperative, full partners. You following me, right? Okay, that's God's plan for each and every one of us. Here's our beginning thought this morning. It's on the screen. When we, as Christians, when we say that we are followers of Jesus, what exactly do we mean? Do we mean that we like him but don't really listen to him? Do we mean that we listen to him but still do what we want to if we don't like what he has to say? Do we mean that we listen to him, obey him, and earnestly seek out his guidance and counsel for everything in our lives? When you and I say that we're Christians, that we're Christ followers... What exactly do we mean? Our foundation text is in James chapter 2. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? To paraphrase this verse on this topic, 
it would read like this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you know what God wants or what he told you to do, but you don't do it? Can that kind of faith save anyone? And of course, you know, uh, he's, James is asking a rhetorical question, right? He's like, no, these things are supposed to line up. It's not just what facts you believe. It's are the facts you're believing, are they alive in your life and are they becoming in alignment with what God has for you. Now, today, as we talk about our response to God's word and God's voice, we, ha we have to also talk about what disobedience to that means. And it means sin in our lives, right? So I, I wanna talk to you real quick before we jump into the meat of the message about two areas of sin. Now over here, um, you know, I hit my thumb with a hammer and the F word comes out right? I, I get all emotional and I get in the heat of the moment and I just, I talk poorly to somebody, right? I make a mistake that was unplanned. It just spur of the moment, boom. I didn't meet God's standards right there. Oh my gosh, forgive me. Okay. But then there's another kind of sin. And I call this organized planned sin. You know, like there's crime and there's organized crime, right? Well, there's sins in our lives that we are committing because we plan to. Would you like an example? Somebody hurt you last week, pretty bad. And you don't wanna forgive them, you wanna go hurt them back. God's voice, God's word says, forgive them. And you say, no, I'm not gonna do that. They don't deserve my grace. They don't deserve forgiveness. They deserve to be punished. I'm not going to respond correctly to God's voice. I'm going to respond the way I want to. And I plan on making them suffer. That's organized, planned disobedience. Today, we're not talking about hitting your thumb and saying a cuss word. By the way, don't do either one of those. What we're talking about today is there's things that you already know God wants you to do and be or that God wants you to stop doing and being. There's already things that God has been speaking to you about. Whether you haven't read your Bible in a while, whether you haven't been in church for a while, there's just certain things about your life that you already know God wants changed. You already know that. And for some reason, you're not responding well to it. You're responding in defiance and in selfishness and in disobedience. That's what we're talking today. How do we respond to the voice and word of God? You ready to jump in? Sounds fun, doesn't it? Okay. All right. Observation number one, every one of us hears God's voice through a different filter. Every one of us hears God's voice through a different filter. Okay, so there was a time um, early on in my relationship with Jesus where I would, I, would, I would go to church, I'd hear the pastor, I'd read, I'd read the Bible, other Christians would talk to me. Anyhow, God's voice was getting to me, but I didn't realize that I was listening to God's voice and I was processing it through a couple different filters. So here's the first filter that I was using. I was filtering God's voice through the filter of disappointment. And so even though the pastor was doing like a great job of explaining it and, and really like there's no, I mean, I'm reading the words on the page and I can't determine tone really. You know, kind of like you're texting and you can't tell what the tone is. And I'd hear other Christians talk about the word of God and most of them were always positive and uplifting, but for some reason, I was processing the truth of God's voice, and I always felt like God was disappointed with me. You know, it's like, be kind to one another. Don't be a jerk face. Man, I'm a jerk face. God must be disappointed with me because I'm a jerk face. And I, I would process almost all of God's word. And then the outcome was 
I came to the conclusion that he was disappointed with me. Now, have you ever spent time with somebody who's disappointed with you? And then you spend time with them again and they're still disappointed? And you do it again and they're still... Isn't that so fun? Somebody who's always disappointed in you, we become less and less likely to want to hang around them. Right? I was using this filter I didn't even know. And I just felt like God was disappointed with me all the time because I kept messing up. I still keep messing up. And I just felt, well, he, he must be disappointed in me. And that's how I was receiving God's truth. Another filter was the filter of anger. Well, if God's disappointed, he must be angry. Because when I'm disappointed, I get angry. So if that's how I do it, that must be how God does it, right? Wrong. That's not how he does it at all. And I started processing everything through anger. The third filter, the filter of critical voices. I started hearing God's word nitpicking me to death because I was so bad at doing God's word. I just felt like I was getting nitpicked every time I opened my Bible, every time I went to church, every time I talked with a Christian who's obviously better than me, I just felt like my faith and my life were being nitpicked to death. And, and, I, and I, I obviously did not know how to process this. Now, here's what I have learned since then. I didn't know the difference between God's voice and the devil's voice. You see, God's voice can talk to you about something that's wrong in your life, and he does it in a loving and lifting manner. The devil will use the exact same verse, and he will pick you to pieces leading to defeat and depression. Amen. And that's where I was. I wasn't able to determine, I mean, it was truth, it's the same verse, but how it was being applied, I felt like it was God's voice that was critical of me, when really it was the other guys. And then, and then here's this, uh, this last filter. The filter of other people's condemnation and judgment. Yeah, that's always fun, right? We do that to people sometimes, Christians. Like, we don't communicate the truth in love, we you know, kind of crank them out of the ballpark every once in a while. And sometimes when you have an experience with a Christian who's a little rough around the edges and they're trying to talk to you about why you're a loser, that stuff sticks, doesn't it? And there's a residue that's left. And that residue was condemnation and judgment. In Matthew chapter 23, um, Starting with verse 13. This isn't on the screen. This is just up here. Um, we call it the seven woes. Jesus is starting to address the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And he says this, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you. And this goes on, we call it the seven woes, right? And I remember reading this, and, and the first time I read it, here's what I heard. I heard condemnation Jesus. Up on, I, I pictured him up like up on a rock or something. Woe is you, you morons! Woe is you! Right? Like he was just like this big condemning figure. And I was on the phone. This was back when I was in the Navy. So, you know, a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm on the phone with the youth pastor that led me back to the Lord when I was in the Navy. His name is Dewey. And Dewey and I were discussing this. And Dewey said that in a, in a recent prayer time, he was reading this and something didn't sit right. And so he kind of sat with God for a while and inquired about it. And he's like, what, what are you trying to say to these guys? And Dewey said that he heard God's voice differently this time. Instead of the, woe is you, he heard the voice of Jesus sound more like this. Man, guys, what was you? Because you just don't get it. You know, you, you do all this rule keeping, but 
you're really not loving people. And what you don't realize is you're turning people, you're turning people into worse followers of me. Woe is you guys. And for the first moment in Dewey's life, he heard, he heard God use these verses with compassion. And that's when I realized that I've been using the wrong filter or I've been listening to the wrong voice. In Matthew chapter nine, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Now remember, these multitudes of people, these are all sinners. And just like you and me, all of our sin, my sin is my fault. Nobody made me do anything. Nobody, nobody made me commit sin. Nobody made me ignore God. I'm the one responsible. Drew Foster is responsible for Drew Foster's sin, right? So just like these people here, they're all responsible for the mess they're in, but yet Jesus is moved with compassion. Take a look at this truth on your screen. When you and I are down in the pit, Jesus doesn't stand on top of it and condemn us. He jumps down in the pit to lift us up. That's what he does. John 3, 17, for the son of man did not come to condemn, right? But he came to save. And I think sometimes we just hear God's voice and God's truth through a filter. So here's, here's my request of you. The next time you hear a sermon, you know, like today, or the next time you read the word of God or you're listening to a podcast or a video or whatever, be aware of what filter you're receiving the voice of God in. Because my firsthand experience tells me it matters. It matters. Number two, understand how God's voice works. It's essential to responding correctly to it. So, parents, going back to you, have you ever had a child not do what you tell them and then a phrase out of your mouth is, what am I, wasting my breath? You, your, your voice as a parent has a purpose, right? Well, God, God's voice has a purpose. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, Paul tells us exactly how God uses his voice. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to, pre to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Four specific things Paul mentions here. First one, God uses his voice to teach us truth and morality. He teaches us how to love, okay? Second thing, God uses his voice to reveal what is wrong, misaligned, or sinful in our lives. And this is, this is where our culture is training us against God. The culture around you says, don't feel bad for how you live your life and don't let anything or anyone make you feel bad. That's the culture we live in. Except, friends, when our lives are out of misalignment with the word of God, we hope that the Holy Spirit brings conviction, which is holy guilt, which makes you feel bad. Holy conviction from the Holy Spirit is lifting. Guilt and condemnation is a tool of the enemy. It's depressing. Know the difference, right? But God uses his word to reveal what's wrong. God uses his voice to lovingly correct us. Okay? And then God uses his voice to equip us for ministry. Now, not all scriptures are cut and dry like this. But in Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32, this is an example of, of how these two verses alone accomplish all four of these tasks. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Okay, so right off the top, God is trying to teach us about what is true and what is moral love. And he does it by contrasting, get rid of all the rage and the anger and the harsh words. Instead, I want you to be kind and be filled with tenderheartedness and forgiving. 
So he's trying to train us in these two voices, right? Now, in verse 31, he's revealing or possibly revealing some things in our lives that are out of alignment with his will for us. But oftentimes, we just read it and move on. We're like, oh yeah, I, sh I shouldn't be a jerk. Okay, next. But what if, what if we were to read verses, which 31 is a command, right? It says get rid of, so it's telling us to do something. What if we were to take some of these commands and just kind of pause and just say, okay, God, I don't think there's anything wrong right now, but you know me better than I know myself. So I'm going to open up, I'm going to give you some time right now, and I'm going to open up my heart, and I'm going to let you search me. Lord, do I have any bitterness in my life? Will you, will you show me that? Lord, lately, have, have I been sharp-tongued with somebody? Have I, have I used harsh words? And if I have, where's that coming from? Lord, have I just been angry for no reason? Can, can you just show me if I'm being a jerk somewhere or to somebody? And if we'll pause for a moment on some of these commands that we read and we give him that space, he'll reveal to us some misalignments. Amen. So just, just quick question. If you were misaligned, wouldn't you want somebody to tell you? It's hard sometimes, isn't it? Because we all want to be right. We don't want to be told we're wrong. We have to be open. <laughs> Be open to the revealing nature of God's word. All right? It goes on. He corrects us. Get rid of it. Instead, do this. And then in verse 32, if we actually applied this, you know what, God? Help me be a kind person. Fix it in here. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a jack wagon sometimes. I don't want to be that. Lord, will you transform me into a person of kindness so then that's what I can dish out? Lord, will you help me have a tender heart instead of a hard heart that matches my hard head? Lord, will you teach me to have a forgiving heart? And so if we approach God's word this way, it can, it can teach, it can reveal, it can correct, and it can equip. That's what it's trying to do at all times, if we'll give it the space. Do, uh, do any of you know somebody who, who was kind of a jerk? Is it me? So I used to be this guy, and I would tell people, hey, man, if you don't like it, tough. That's your problem. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the way I see it. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. That's tough. I don't care. You know a person like that? Maybe they're a coworker. Maybe they're in your family, Right? where what they've done is they've given themselves liberty and license to treat people poorly because they think they're right. They think they're self-right or self-righteous. If that's where you are right now in your life, from somebody that used to be that guy, just because you think you know the truth doesn't give you permission to treat others poorly. Can I get an amen? amen? Right. Number three, responding correctly to God's voice is how we show true and genuine love to him. In John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. Jesus did not say, if you love me, attend church. If you love me, volunteer in the nursery. If you love me, sing the songs. If you, that's not what he said. Now, all those are helpful. We encourage all of them. What he says is, if you love me, then show me by obeying my commands. Right? Let, let's, let's cooperate a little more here. Let's be in partnership a little more here. Take a look at this truth. God's love language is obedience. I don't care how good you can sing. I don't care how good you can preach. 
It doesn't matter how many rules you follow. God's love language at its core is obedience. And you could probably take out that word obedience and just put in faithfulness, right? That's where God's love language is. In Luke chapter six, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? God's love language is obedience. And then number four, we're gonna, we're gonna close this down. This is gonna be the, the application portion of our time together. This is gonna be where some of this disobedience can get handled at the root level. The root cause of disobedience in our lives boils down to a simple lack of trust and a simple lack of love. Do I love God enough to obey him? Do I trust him enough to obey him? And I'm just gonna speak out of my own life. A lot of my planned disobedience happens because I don't trust God is gonna work it out the way I want it worked out. Amen. Let's go back to that person that hurt me or hurt you a week ago. You know what? My plan of popping their head off is way better than your plan of forgiving them, God. I mean, they need to learn their lesson through pain and I'll feel good if I cause the pain. So I'm just gonna stay over here in my plan because I trust that my plan will produce the results necessary. Your plan of forgiving them is no fun at all and I don't think it'll produce the results that I want. A lot of my planned, organized disobedience in my life, it comes because I don't trust God enough. That's, that's really what it, what it boils down to. Now, now, remember over here, I got the hammer and I hit my thumb and then a word comes out. Okay, we're not talking about that. Like me having an emotional moment and just responding out of emotion really doesn't have a whole lot to do with trust. It has a lot to do with training. But over here, it's a trust issue. Do I trust that God's plan is what's best for me? And do I trust and do I love him enough to say, okay, I'll do it your way. Amen. Ladies, I wanna use you one last time as an example. I've done this before and it's a terrible example, but it makes the point. So if your amazing husband or boyfriend wakes up every morning, babe, I love you. And he writes little notes, I love you, you're so awesome, you're so smart and you're so funny. I love you, I'm the luckiest guy ever. And he does this morning, noon, and night. Tells you all the time that he loves you and notes and texts and all kind of stuff, right? But every evening he steps out of the house and cheats on you. Is that love? No. So there must be something about this. Love must be supported by action. Right? And, 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 and I know the word obedience is a rough word for some people. So let's just change it and make it a little more palpable, even though it's the same thing. Faithfulness. Am I being faithful to what I know God wants me to do and, do and be? Excuse me. How do we respond to the word of God? Take a look at this last uh, this last slide, it's our, it's our reflection. It's our reflection slide. These are two prayers that I have prayed since I became a pastor, a full-time pastor 18 years ago. And these two prayers have, I've consecutively played them, or I've, I have consecutively and consistently prayed them throughout my ministry career the last 18 years. And these two prayers alone have single-handedly increased my level of cooperation and increased my level of partnership. And then the byproduct is I have grown so close to Jesus, it's not even funny. And it's all because of these two prayers. God, help me love you more than I do right now. Help me love you to, point, to the point of obedience. God, help me trust you more than I do right now. Help me trust you to the point of obedience. There's an exchange between Jesus and some dude in the Bible where Jesus, the guy comes up, asks Jesus a question, Jesus answers it, and the man responds, Lord, I do believe. 
Help me in my unbelief. You know, you know what, friends? I think many of you in this room love God. We're not saying we don't love God. But do we love God enough to respond properly to his voice? We're not saying we don't trust God. All of us on some level trust God. But do we trust him enough? These two prayers echo that man's prayer. Lord, I do love you and I do trust you. Help me in all the areas and in all the ways that I'm not loving you well and I'm not trusting you deep enough. Those are the prayers. So would you bow your head and just close your eyes real quick? And I want us to take just a few moments and get a little practice talking to God. Whether you've been following him for five minutes or 50 years, we can all love him more and we can all trust him more. And the byproducts of loving and trusting God will be a life of fruitfulness and joy that you just can't even imagine. So let's just take a few moments right now individually and let's have a talk with God about these two prayers. Will you stand with me, please, as I pray and close our time together? Lord Jesus, we thank you that not only you came to save us, but you came to do life with us. Like you are really interested in living our lives together. And you want us to partner and to cooperate. You're not just calling us to obey a bunch of commands and that somehow defines our relationship with you. It's the love and the trust that you develop in us that defines that relationship. And so Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, what you've been doing. Lord, we do love you and we do trust you and we do have faith. Help us in all the ways that our faith is falling short because our love and our trust have not been built. Lord, fill us with your presence to the point where we can trust you. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here this weekend. Have a great rest of your week. I look forward to seeing you guys next week.